Services Committee. Uh, that committee chair suggested I might want to take a look at this person called James Rippleton. I'd never heard of before, but I was told that James had been born and died only about 15 miles from where I am in Canton, New York. Um, I teamed up with my colleague, Rita Goldberg. Uh, Rita taught in the Spanish department at St. Lawrence and for four years, uh, Rita and I did some pretty solid work. Rita was very uh, accomplished with dealing with genealogy, but she could find some rather rare and out of the way bits and pieces. Uh, and then unfortunately about a year and a half ago, uh, Rita had an accident, uh, fell on the ice and, and really seriously damaged her hip and she couldn't get around. Uh, she had a, was diagnosed with a cancer at the same time and she really could not continue to work uh, on this project that we were involved with together. So we had hoped to do a quarterly uh, that would be presented uh, last fall. I went ahead by myself uh, pretty much, but incorporated as much material as Rita had put together for me. Uh, and I think uh, finally it was put together. We got it published. About 900 copies were sent out and I'm glad that's sort of behind us. But that was mostly focusing on Rickleton and St. Lawrence County. Tonight, we're gonna try to focus a bit more on Rickleton and and Maplewood, excuse me, Maplewood. Um, the, uh, I intend to make this presentation without comments or questions. I hope we you all stick around and we can do that uh, after I'm through presenting my information. Um, so that's about where we are. And let me begin. Uh, Ellie, can you help me with this? Because I might, might want to know. This person, Rickleton, is uh, fairly complex. I put up a list of some of the terms that uh, some other authors have used to describe Rickleton. Sometimes just a one word or two of photographer, teacher, adventurer, big game hunter, war correspondent, war journalist, and so on. A few people have had to expand that and talk a little bit more about uh, how they feel about this gentleman. He's been defined as a little modest bespectacled man, a stern disciplinarian, a kind and genial friend to interested students, a staunch and self-contained individualist. One I really like is the description as that he was like a spirited young horse harnessed to a treadmill. You might try to imagine that as we go in there. Deep set eyes sparkling glowed as he spoke and endowed with fine physique and no end of pluck. I want to show you where Rickleton was born. And that would be, uh, I think, if you can find this cursor, this is a map that shows Waddington on the edge of the of the St. Lawrence River, which is also the Canadian border, um, about four miles south of, of Waddington, uh, the Bra the Brandy Brook runs diagonally through the area, and at the bottom right hand part of the screen, you'll see an R. Rickleton. That's Robert Rickleton. That is James' brother. Uh, he lives on the halfway house road. It's off the road about uh, three, four hundred yards. And then the, ha the uh, halfway house road does come down here. This little intersection that I'm showing you at the bottom of the screen has a blacksmith shop, it had a schoolhouse, a tavern, and some residents. The other area you should be aware of, I'm going to be mentioning, is up here in the where the Scotch settlement was. Up here, there is also a, there's a church, there's a school. Uh, the Ruff, Rutherfords are up there. Uh, Rickleton married a Rutherford. And anyway, this is, uh, this is where we are. Halfway, incidentally, gets its name because we're halfway between Waddington at the top and then about five miles south is where uh, Madrid is. This is what I've always understood to be the house on the site of where Rickleton and his family lived. Eight kids were uh, grew up here. 
Um, obviously, the log cabin has been covered over by this bit of mess of things. This house was uh, was is not in good shape when I see it here. I was able to get the last occupant of that uh, to give me a, a, allow me to join her, and we looked at the uh, up in the attic. I was hoping to find either a, a travel log or some papers and photographs, but we didn't find a scrap of anything up there. And the house now, I I'd hope to try to time this so that uh, about the time this house was gonna be demolished by the farmer who farms around it, and that I could find some evidence of maybe a log cabin. But unfortunately, I got there just a few weeks ago and I must've been a couple weeks too late. So uh, I really can't verify it, but maps certainly tell me this is where uh, Rickleton was born and where he is. Uh, okay, Ellie, can you help me get move this? Oh, I see. You got it. Yeah, well, you're not doing that. All right, the Scotch Presbyterian Church, as it looks today, a cyclone cyclone took the roof of an earlier church that Rickleton would have attended. This one was rebuilt in in uh, 1889. But this church uh, meant a lot to the whole Rickleton family, and certainly to so many of the Scots that are there. Rickleton. Uh, was not satisfied just with his eighth grade education. Uh, his father thought he should be. And so Rickleton had to come up with his own money to be able to attend the Canton Academy. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a bit of a surprise to his family, but he thought he might prepare himself a bit more for college if he uh, went here. Here is uh, St. Lawrence University's, uh, what's now called Richard. In Hall, probably in about 1867, Rickleton entered St. Lawrence. We don't know too much about any courses that he took there, but there was one requ requirement that a freshman had to make at the end of that year, and that was to make an or oratorial presentation. Rickleton spoke about the importance of trifles. Uh, before we get into the little meat of this presentation, I want to familiarize you a bit with what stereography is. And um, because uh, so much of Rickleton's work is centered around the stereograph, this is a camera similar to what uh, Rickleton would have used. Um, the, the basic principle of this stereo camera works very much similar to the way the human eye works. The reason we see in depth and in three dimension is because we've got our two eyes set about two and a half inches apart. Uh, the left eye by itself sees just a little bit more of the lights, left side of an object. If you're looking at it, the right eye is gonna see a little bit more of the right side. The camera works the same way. In this case, the, the camera would be loaded with a uh, sensitized piece of, of glass, probably in this case, either five by seven or eight by 10. And uh, the once the focus has been made, uh, the shutters simultaneously open for these two lenses and the, the plate is exposed uh, with two different images. The images can then be as a negative, after their process as a negative, that negative can be used to make a positive. And in this case, the positive image has been mounted on a piece of cardboard and you to view it, you need some kind of a viewer. In this case, this viewer is pretty typical of uh, the 1880, 1890 stere stereoscopes. Uh, there's a slight magnification in the lens. The hood surrounds and keeps out some of the extraneous, extraneous light. And there's a focus by moving the sliding uh, image closer and further away from it. Just to the right is a small paper stereoscope that I used to include within the quarterly that uh, I had mentioned that we were publishing. And uh, it was uh, just a little inexpensive thing, but that was attached to the, to the quarterly so that my viewers could see in three dimensions some of the images that we printed into that quarterly. The company Underwood and Underwood was very successful with a business model 
And here you see their idea, which is to be within arm's reach of distant countries. It's only necessary to be within arm's reach of the Underwood stereograph travel system. Uh, here's a gentleman in his study, his fingers on a book. Uh, he's got a map in front of him. It looks like he's studying something in, in uh, Italy. This says Rome in here, and he's viewing a card. So this is the way that the traveling system would, would work together. It's a patented system of, of images and then guidebook and then the, the map system. Um, I want to mention two sources that were primary to what uh, I had, really important. Uh, St. Lawrence University archives uh, has about 1,100 glass slides that Rickleton had, part of them Rickleton had made, some of them he simply used. But this was given to the St. Lawrence. Initially, Rickleton gave them to his neighbor in Waddington, who was Dr. Heffler. And uh, then in a roundabout way, they went through a couple other people and they end up being donated to, to St. Lawrence. There's, this, there's three elements. There's the glass slides. There's a lantern slide projector. Here's a view of the interior of that uh, lantern slide projector with the uh, metal shroud off. Um, there were also a, about 22 scripts this script is through darkest Africa. And I think in this case, it's pretty safe to say Rickleton uh, was an author for a good part of this, not of all of the scripts, but, uh, but some of them. Um, the other person and sit, that I really want to give credit to is James Rickleton Wilson. Um, and when I discovered that uh, that Jim Wilson had built a website focusing on Rickleton. It was uh, a great thing to see. Uh, Jim had included uh, things on education, things on, on Edison, some, some things on the African journey. Uh, he hadn't completed this. And Jim, if you're listening, uh, I'm still willing to help you get rid of some of these asterisks that indicate that there's some inactive links here. But, uh, I'm coming. To, I'm coming to Canton to seek your help. All right, <laughs> we'll we'll look for you. Um, the uh, it was great to to get to know Jim. Uh, we got, we became pretty good friends. Uh, Jim invited us to come to his house. We looked at a trunk that his father had. That was uh, uh, George Wilson. Um, in that trunk, we found materials that included a scrapbook and included newspaper clippings, a 1909 diary we're going to talk about later, uh, letters to and from Edison, stereographic images, uh, and more. Uh, Jim arranged also uh, meetings for, at the uh, Smithsonian and the Library of Congress for us. So thank you, Jim. Um, I do look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. Um, let's move now to Rickleton as a teacher. Uh, I, Rickleton had, after leaving St. Lawrence uh, and getting married to Christine Rutherford, he had worked just very briefly, maybe for one term, um, at, at the same school that he went to, and that was the halfway house school. And then he also worked for a brief term at the Scotch settlement. Uh, once he uh, married Christine, he. They two of them moved to northern New Jersey, where he taught briefly in Parsippany and Whippany. Uh, and then in 1870, the members of the South Orange Board of Education heard of Rickleton as a capable teacher, and they hired him initially for a 12 week term. Uh, interestingly, there had been 45 different teachers in the previous 42 years. But uh, Rickleton changed that. He was uh, to be a teacher for 20 years. He became known as an excellent teacher, respected for the habit of teaching out of doors, uh, hands-on approach. He became a guiding force, really, for many people in shaping the Maplewood school system. He was appreciated by students, although at times he had some difficulty with the school board. Um, before I get into those difficulties, 
um, the, my colleague that I mentioned, Rita Goldberg, was visited the Maplewood Library at one time, and she found and sent to me this image of Rickleton that I'm guessing was taken somewhere between 1870 and 1890. Um, let's say it's 1880. Um, he, uh, and if you see an artifact running through this, it's because Rita shot this through a, a acetate covering on it. But this is good to see this. I had never seen this image before she found it. I'm not sure where, where he is, but uh, take note of this uh, coat and the, and the one button. This is a, a digressing a bit. But this was uh, might be interesting to some of the people in Maplewood. This uh, shows James Rickleton's daughter Elizabeth, and somewhere around 1900. So I am getting out of a chronological order here. Uh, Elizabeth was teaching a geography class in the Maplewood school, and um, this is to, this is pretty interesting to to see and. Uh, it adds at least, I don't know exactly how long she did teach at Maplewood, but uh, she was there and living at 644 Valley Street where um, James lived. This was uh, also thanks to uh, Jim Wilson. Uh, Jim had, had uh, given access to this uh, address to parents. I'm going back now to one of the the, one of the little problems that uh, Rickleton had, but I want to say that he he solved this problem. The this is a cover to an address to parents. Jim had cleaned that up, reformatted uh, it, and made it uh, a lot more readable. This was done in 1872, so Rickleton I think began his teaching in 1871. So this was probably in the second year. He decides to to, to have a word or two to the uh, to the parents and to the school board. Uh, and they were pretty strong words. I'm going to read you a little bit of this. I want to start right here. Uh, this is a six page missile. And he says, and in conclusion, allow us to repeat consecutively some of the more essential elements of parental duty, a practical recognition of which will subserve the purpose of our brief petition, promote greatly the general and individual interests of your school, satisfy the demands of society, entail a priceless boon to your children, and entitle you to the fruition of a more noble and worthy citizenship. So there's 14 points here. I'll go through some of them fairly quickly, but uh, send your children regularly and seasonably to school, furnish them promptly with necessary texts and books, require them to observe scrupulously the rules and regulations of the school, encouraging them ready and cheerful obedience to their teacher, encourage them to be orderly and systematic in everything they do, encourage them to be studious, diligent, and persevering, manifest an interest in their studies at home, visit them frequently at school. Do not allow your children to become addicted too much to light reading, but cultivate it. A love of, for proper books and see that they read understandingly. Cultivate your children truthfulness, affection and forbearance, help us to cultivate in them habits of politeness and personal neatness. Do not suffer your children to neglect the rudimentary English branches by giving precedence to such fashionable acquirements as music, drawing, etc. When absence or tardiness becomes absolutely unavoidable, promptly notify us by an exculpatory note and help us to cultivate every virtue and extirpate every vice in your children. Final words, a faithful performance of the above duties will secure for you a rich recompense in the advancement of your children in knowledge and virtue. And for us that much needed sympathy and cooperation, which prompts our appeal. With affectionate deference, your humble servant and children's teacher. Um, I hope if there's any teachers in the audience that you appreciate these uh, words of wisdom, uh, they were pretty bold and for Rickleton to offer this in the first year, but uh, he did it and I think it, uh, it worked. Later on, this was in uh, 1980, uh, things had pretty well been patched up as a tribute to Rickleton, both as a teacher and a world explorer. 
a mural was designed by the Hungarian artist Stefan Jaros, installed in 1980 in the Maplewood Civic Center. It depicts Ruckelton conducting a class outside the school where he taught. Uh, you can see, as you can see, some parents are there showing some interest, children with a camera, possibly viewing stereographs, collecting and sharing uh, plant and animal specimen. Uh, here's a detail. Uh, and uh, you, you can see that uh, Rick Hilton is still wearing that same coat we saw before. Uh, just because this was done in 1980 doesn't mean that coat lasted that long. Uh, um, I want to move next to talk about what you've probably heard about is the Dormo cart. The Dormo cart uh, begins with this uh, outing magazine. You're seeing a copy of a cover from October of 1887. The Outing Magazine was an illustrated monthly magazine that covered sporting and adventure activities like biking, camping, canoeing, shooting, yachting, and Rickleton especially, travel, especially in faraway places. The editor asked Rickleton if he would consider a trip through Northern Russia, starting at Archangel on the White Sea and ending in St. Petersburg. It's gonna be a distance of about 500 miles and much of it would be through wilderness areas that might include wolves or robbers and would he would he write about this uh, experience for the magazine. Um, well, Rickleton uh, didn't delay. He said yes, and he began almost immediately to design and construct a device, a three-wheeled cart, which he called a Dormo cart. He could push it by day, sleep in it by night, uh, it housed his food, cooking utensils, medicine, and photographic gear, bedroll, had an inflatable pillow. Uh, he had a, for protection, he had a revolver and a good size uh, knife. Here's the opposite side of that. You can see that there's a, a canvas type material that could be pulled down so that in inclement weather, uh, he could be inside of that. He could sleep in that. Um, there's also a odometer on the uh, near the hub on this wheel. Uh, I got interested enough to try to make a little model of this so I could understand it better. And uh, this is what I came up with. I had photographed using the glass plate negatives that I just showed you that were in the St. Lawrence collection. I was able to enlarge an image, a digital image. So that I had a, a wagon, an image of the wheel that was six inches high in diameter. Rickleton's description in the outing magazine uh, in one of the episodes it men mentioned that this when these actual wheels were 48 inches in diameter so because i was working with a six inch photograph i had a one to eight scale i used his numbers that related to the width and the height and the, and all that so i built this model but it's the one way i like to work is to get my hands onto things to understand them a little bit and that helped me a bit one of the problems that Rickleton had, one of the other problems, I mean, one of many problems, is that he didn't, didn't know much about the Russian language, but he thought a little bit of vocabulary words, these 25 words might help him if he had to say uh, eggs or fire or black bread or how much. And uh, I won't try to, uh, I worked at this for a while, but I'm not gonna show you how far I got in pronouncing uh, Russian. Um, here's an image that one of the outing illustrators used to illustrate the the seven part series incidentally the series starts with april runs through october of 1887 the trip itself was in the summer of uh, of 86. um what i find interesting here it shows rickleton pushing his his dormal cart um surprising some native person who thinks this is kind of a weird thing but what i wanted to show you that there was a photograph of rickleton actually I guess I haven't mentioned this yet, but there was an 18 by 18 trap door in the bottom of this thing where Rickleton could actually crawl into it from beneath and uh, push it as he's doing here, uh, particularly if he's uh, if the weather's bad. But notice how similar, I'm gonna think I could go forward and backward. Take note of, of the distance between the, the lead wheel, the guide wheel and the, and the, and the main wheel here the difference between the flag and one part of this support. 
but they're almost identical. So my suggestion is Rickleton had access to this photograph, Rickleton had. Rickleton made available to the illustrator this photograph so that the illustrator could actually use the perspective and the scale and what he did. Why these photographs weren't in the, in the journal itself is probably because it was difficult to have every printing shop have a, uh, be able to, to deal with the tonal variations of, of the photograph. It takes a half tone negative to do that. So they work much better with just a line drawing. So here was a line drawing, probably in pencil and ink, uh, that an illustrator used to describe some of the more difficulties that Rickleton faced. I should point out that Rickleton didn't walk the whole 500 miles. At times, he caught a ride with uh, the Russian postal system that went through this area. And either he bought or bartered or talked his way onto a, uh, into a ride. Here, his dormo cart wheels have been taken off, and it's sitting crossways. He describes in quite detail the excitement of, uh, of uh, how fast a three horse wagon can go and how rough that ride is. <clears throat> um, leaving the dormo cart, I want to at least briefly talk about one of the big projects that Rickleton was involved in. That was when Thomas Edison asked him if he would help find a, an answer that he was trying to find on how to get an incandescent bulb burning for more than just a few seconds or a brief minute. Now, yeah, Rickleton was only one of about four or five different people who had been sent out all over the world to try to find, uh, probably in the bamboo family or the palm family, some kind of organic material that could actually serve the purpose that Edison needed. And uh, the photograph you're looking at uh, is a bit crude, I'll admit, uh, it, but it was on display at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And it represents just some of the different uh, samples that came into the lab where they were trying to find out uh, if these kind of things would, would burn long enough to really make uh, a, a big difference in, in what this light was. But um, the story of, of the Rickleton and the bamboo one is, is a very interesting story. I don't have enough time tonight to show you or to go through some of the details, but he, uh, he promised his students when he left uh, Maplewood, he was going to go east and he was going to come back exactly a year later from the west. Uh, students were there to meet him uh, when he came back. There was a celebration and so on. And uh, Rickleton had been worried that uh, and was reluctant in a way to uh, take that year off because he thought he might not have a job back uh, offered to him when he got back. But Edison supposedly had said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. It wasn't just that easy when he did get back. It took a while before they finally uh, brought him back in. But that whole story and many other parts of it are, are available. And uh, you, you might want to look them up some other place sometime. I want to move to the um, getting back into this uh, project that, that involves the Underwood and Underwood. This is what the real travel systems look like. What you're looking at here is a really a box. It's fashioned as if it were a leather bound book. But it's a box that will hold 800, or excuse me, 100 uh, stereograph images. It includes a 300 page book, in this case, written by James Rickleton. We're looking at, at the project on, on just on India. So this is um, also then with the book, there is a packet of maps. The map that I've spread out here is of Calcutta. What's really interesting about it, and uh, is that each image, each stereographic image, is written in two or three pages uh, in the book by Rickleton. He is written on the back of each one, and he also identifies where he was. This, the number here, would coincide with where he was positioned, and so on. So it's a very thorough system, and 
you know, just want to point out that whereas some people were publishing and using stereographs uh, for their novelty, for the humor, in fact, some of you may have had seen a collection of rather uh, risque images that, that will seem to be very popular. The Underwood and Underwood people in this case recognized that education was the, the, the best use of this material. Okay. Um, the, um, here we have a, an example of Rickleton uh, in India. Sometimes he had to uh, build a stand to uh, be able to get a good shot. This is of the Durbar in Delhi, India. Uh, here, uh, Rickleton has shown how Hindu cows enjoy life in Calcutta. Uh, he would sometimes, in writing, mention that this is not the way uh, they dealt with cows up in St. Lawrence County or in uh, New Jersey. Uh, Rickleton was usually interested in, in uh, transportation systems. This one is uh, caught his attention. It's inflating bullock skins. A bullock is a young calf, I guess, in a bull calf. And uh, the nostril and the legs have been tied off. Uh, and you see some gentleman here uh, inflating or acting like he's inflating this uh, uh, as a raft. Several could be tied together. Um, yeah, Rickleton didn't miss seeing the fakir on a bed of uh, nails, but he did point out in writing and uh, showing a little bit of uh, skepticism. He noticed that at the time it took for him to set up the camera, the fakir had glanced down a couple of times to see if the coin that was on the cloth here had served to uh, entice some tourists maybe to add another coin, or he was probably worried that he might lose the coin that he had. Here, uh, Rickleton is showing a, in Banaras, India, a vegetarian of 46 years. He's lifting a 960 pound weight. Uh, Rickleton assures us that the, the weights and measure people have certified that this is not a, a hoax. Um, moving away from India for a moment, just with only one shot of, from the Philippines, uh, Rickleton, uh, in a somewhat ironic way, says civilized warfare restoring men we had to shoot. Uh, let me show you a few things from China. First of all, just a shot that is not a part of the hundreds slide set. This is Rickleton, who is about five foot, five and a half inches tall, and he's standing beneath the arms of a seven and a half foot uh, North Chinaman in Hankow. Um, here, Rickleton met up with the king of the beggars, and he, he goes into some detail to talk about the beggars' guild, vein of his excessive raggedness, he says. A topic that can be a little bit uh, touchy at times is the bound foot of the Chinese women. Uh, these women, looking fairly respectful and, uh, are, and dignified, uh, their feet on display, their shoes at least, but uh, I should mention that uh, Rickleton at another time that I won't show, uh, talked a, a mother of a child to, by giving her a dollar or two, that younger woman was talked into uh, unbinding her feet so that uh, Rickleton could, could photograph the deformity of uh, what that was about. While Rickleton was in China doing more or less the tourist kind of photography, a uh, trouble broke out in the form of, of what's now called the Boxer Rebellion. And I'm not going into detail with that, but uh, peasants and uh, uh, were very upset with uh, crop failures, hunger, uh, and they rebelled and took their anger out against missionaries, white people in general, and there was a lot of killing and the armies from several different forces had to be coming to help foil that. These are Marines sitting in the background. Um, moving to the Russo-Japanese War, this is where Rickleton, I think, really defines himself as a photojournalist. And, uh, and he defines his, the horrors of war as he sees them. He's not working to try to create a sensational image that would help someone else uh, sell a magazine or a newspaper. But here he is with gallant survivors of the battle. Uh, this is a bit of a problem for me and for some, several other people. 
This image shows the horrors of modern war with a trench filled with Japanese dead in a Russian fort. I don't believe, although Rush, Rickleton got access through means that uh, represent his, his kind of way of, of playing, how should I say that? He was able to gain access to the front lines in Manchuria of the Japanese lines. I can't believe that he got access as, as this photographer would. So I think this is probably shot by a Russian photographer. On the other hand, I think Rickleton wrote the captions and he wrote the messages on the back that are fairly extensive and so on. Moving quickly uh, to his diary. This diary is full of some wonderful things. At age 65, he decides to go to Africa to shoot both photographs and big game. Uh, here's Rickleton with a morning hip, hippopotamus hunt. And uh, in this particular case, uh, Rickleton has, his diary says that some of these men in the background actually helped him move the hippopotamus into position for the camera. And of course he poses himself. Here's a detail of that, you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but this is, um, this hippopotamus was, uh, let me back up just a moment. The men in the background would have helped Rickleton find where the hippos might be uh, frequenting. Uh, Rickleton would have shot and killed these animals, actually three of them in one morning. They would have helped pull them ashore and later they're going to help butcher them. They're gonna distribute the meat to their friends, family and the villages. And then um, they're gonna help carry the trophies, in this case, the hippopotamus heads uh, on the way back. And eventually, here's another shot of returning with the trophies, the big game hunt. This same heads that you're looking at here, this are, were eventually arrived in uh, Maplewood, New Jersey, and then furthermore, eventually into Waddington. Here's a quick, view of the distances traveled. Rickleton is known for keeping a pretty accurate record of how far he walked and how many miles he traveled. He even mentions here, starting with Maplewood to New York City, 15 miles. But then he's got the uh, cross Atlantic thing going on here. Eventually going through all of these, he has 26,738 miles for this whole trip. He would usually then figure out how much money he spent on the whole trip from fares to ammunition and so on, and then figure out how much he paid per mile. The back of uh, that 1909 diary uh, has is some interesting material. He had some words and saying, I'll just read one to you, fundamental human nature, the same the world over. And then a more mysterious one, the bubble glory of the common mouth. We'll stop there. <laughs> Moving quickly to uh, the last of, the, of uh, what we're gonna be looking at, Edison called Rickleton again uh, to, to try to work with a movie camera. Here is a, neither Rickleton nor Edison with a uh, kinetographic camera. Uh, Edison also had to come up with a kinetographic uh, system to be able to, to uh, project those. But here was what uh, Rickleton got from Edison, who was asking him to go to Africa and also to go to Australia, go to Japan, go to a lot of places. But especially in Africa, he wanted Rickleton to get shots of native dances, sham war of natives in various countries, uh, natives manufacturing, weaving and pottery, uh, sports, real and faked, and so on. So Rick Rickleton had a pretty good set of things that he was asked to do. The, he requested that his 22-year-old son, Lamond, join him. Uh, and, and they did that. In Africa, both James and Lamond were doing a good job of fulfilling for the first couple of years the requirements that uh, Edison had laid out. And uh, they decided to go hunting in Kenya. Beaumont fell ill and was diagnosed with a deadly typhoid fever. He was carried 50 miles to Nairobi where he 
after being semi-conscious for, uh, uh, I'll take two weeks, died and was hastily buried in Nairobi. Uh, at that point, uh, Rickleton returns to New York in July of 1914. Um, it's interesting to see that Edison had released three films uh, during the time that Rickleton had been in Africa. These three films titled uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land indicates that Rickleton was uh, a photographer. Damascus in the Ruins of Baalbek says that Rickleton directed it and, uh, and so on. Um, I want to get now into Maplewood, uh, where we're looking at the addition that was put on his house. Uh, you can see in this case, uh, it's a pretty full house. I tried to see this a little, whoops. Oh, uh, how'd they go? I'm sorry. What do I do here, Ellie? I wanted to, by, by moving that sepia tone into black and white, I thought I might be able to see a little bit more detail. In fact, I did, and I realized that the glass plate had been altered with uh, some brush strokes that seemed to give a little more life to those feathers in the vase. This shot, uh, as crude as it is, it has, it's pretty interesting to me because it shows some, the photographer here, not Rickles, and he's down there looking at an instrument or something, was shot down maybe from a balcony. So this apparently, uh, I'm, I'm still a little bit questioning where this comes from. I noticed there's some open windows up in here. So whether this is part of the original house at 644 Valley Street or whether it's uh, the addition, I don't know. Uh, this I wanted to read to you very quickly. Uh, this is by Helen Bates, Maplewood Past and Present. I realize we're uh, running out of time, a little bit over time. This is done in 1948. Um, what Helen Bates says is that when he was 80, his thoughts turned toward Waddington again, where he was born and he made the preparation to move back there to spend his last years, hoping that the people of Maplewood would value his collection as a nucleus for a future museum. He set a modest price on them, I think it was $5,000, and offered them to the town. Obstacles arose, however, and nothing was done. Subsequently, a group of citizens in South Orange and Maplewood proposed that the Board of Education acquired the Rickleton collection to be housed in a fireproof museum to be added to one of the school buildings. And an editorial in the South Orange Record strongly advocated the move and it was warmly seconded by several letters to the editor. Um, a petition was circulated, but the movement came to naught. Uh, the result was that the collections were removed to Waddington with Rickleton. And he was generous in giving the curios to friends, appreciated them. There were uh, many of the gifts still cherished in the town. Um, here's a reference to what was some of the things that were given away. There was a blind man's bell, a cricket cage from China, Chinese shoes, hairpins, inkwell, brush, a club, spear, long siege knife from India, Icelandic lamp, prayer wheel from Ceylon. Um, this is uh, where, when Rickleton went back to Waddington. I'd like you to uh, ignore this woman here. I should say why she's sitting on the fence or how I, why she's, how I'm bothering to use this. Her daughter recognized that I wanted an image of the house that Rickleton lived in in Waddington, 19 Clinton Street. That house is still there. But I also got a barn with it, and that's great to see these. The porch is no longer there. I knocked on a door here just about uh, two weeks ago. The two women would not let me in. They did not want to tell me their name. They asked me why anyone would ever want to know anything about Rickleton. But uh, so I didn't get much out of them. Um, but uh, I was able to satisfy my question about where Rickleton brought his things when he came from Maplewood to New Jersey. This is the Syracuse Her Herald of um, May 19, or yes, 1928, about a year and a half before he was to die. This is a full page on a Sunday paper. It shows Rickleton with hippos, a lot, some of the other things that, were, uh, that we've already kind of talked about. Here's Rickleton with one of the hippo skulls. I did a, a detail of this one image of Rickleton with his same gun that he used to, to shoot 
hippos, uh, shell casings that he brought back from Manchuria. Here he is, probably say, the same day. It's the same bowler hat, the same bow tie, a little bit more gentlemanly view. And I want to end by saying uh, this man uh, is complex. It's a little hard to pin down. But I want to say that I think he his foundation was in Waddington. Those 20 years he spent there uh, gave him a solid basis for working. The, the 20 years he was teacher and principal at, at Maplewood was a great challenge for him. And it gave him an opportunity to use those the summers effectively. Uh, what he brought back in those summer trips, he got into the classroom. Um, if Rickleton were alive today, I'm not sure what he would do, be doing. I would assume he's probably not going to be involved with uh, Twitter as actively. He might be in some more uh, digital work. I would think that he would want to be continue to be looking at issues such as the difference between the really wealthy and the abject poverty that still exists throughout the world. He probably would want to talk about the incivility of this discourse that we seem to be involved in. He, uh, he, he would probably have some things to say about consumer mentality. Um, I don't want to go beyond that, because if he does come back, I don't want to uh, limit what he would like to have to say. And there, I will end this program. Thank you. Thank this you so much, Roger. Sorry I went over. <laughs> this was really, it was fascinating. What a truly complex and interesting individual. Um, if you would like to stop sharing your screen now, we could get a fuller view of our participants and we could do a little Q&A. So if anybody would like to unmute themselves one at a time, feel free to ask a question or make a comment, please. Was anybody taking notes? <laughs> Probably some beautiful colleagues. Several of you could uh, add to. I, you, I thought you'd be interested in to know, Roger, um, this is Susan Newberry. I'm the township historian that I spoke to uh, someone that actually works at the library part time. Uh, she grew up across the street from the Rickleton house, which I think came down in the 1960s. And she went over there with her brother one day and there were still things in the house. <laughs> there were notebooks and objects and that sort of, you know, that just, just have been left. And what happened to them now? Where I'm, are those objects? I'm you? sorry? Where are those notebooks now? Uh, you know, the, she, was a, she was a kid and they didn't think of collecting the, the material. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I would like to see, I've never seen a photograph of the house as it as Rick, as it was when Rick was there. So if anybody has one, they can send me sometime. I appreciate. Not when it. he was there, but yeah, I've got something afterwards. Yeah, that would be good to see. Yeah, and we could help put you in touch with Susan. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Anyone else with questions or comments? Jim, thank you very much for what I borrowed from you. I hope I uh, did justice, but I, it was great to have your uh, input in it. Um, Roger, you did extraordinary. It's, it's enlightening. It's new information. And I've, I've been reviewing slowly. I, I read once. I've been reviewing in detail your and um, your colleagues read us a journal article. But I want to know much more about Africa, particularly the trip you took with Lomond in 1914. So we'll touch base on that. Thank you. Yeah, I know you had some idea of wanting to, to actually visit both the hospital and maybe the, uh, uh, some of the places that uh, the, the two of them were. Uh, well, I took, I took Rickleton's 1909 diary, which I lent to you uh, before, I, um, before I lent it to you. And I, I followed his path up Table Mountain in Cape Town, South Africa, and sort of I mean, for me, it was easy. I had a water bottle and a cell phone. And for him, he was carrying all these, you know, glass plate cameras. He, he had support to do that, but it was very difficult. But he told in great detail in that diary about, you know, finding a proper lodging to, you know, blind the windows and create a, an effective dark room. 
And when I was last in uh, Africa in 19, 2019, and I did go down from, I work in Ethiopia, so I went down to Nairobi and visited the British Commonwealth, British hospital there where Laban died uh, in 1914 at age 24. But yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Very interesting, tremendously interesting ancestor and individual. Is there anybody? And, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to ask: Was there anybody there uh, from from uh, Maplewood who has anything to say about the fact that it, that that collection was once available to Maplewood, but it uh, but it didn't stay there? Any, anybody? Any with thoughts on that one? I, I, um, I yeah, I think it's uh, it's an unfortunate. Um, this is Susan again. I, I think it. You know, the town was. Uh, what year did he pick up and leave again? Nineteen twenty. Nineteen twenty five. Nineteen twenty five. The the For town sure. was so new then, um, just growing. They were in the midst of trying to create Memorial Park. Um, I don't think they, they were very conservative with their money <laughs> and mm -hmm. I don't, it probably would have required building a museum or keeping in a house as a museum or something. And maybe they just felt that they couldn't afford it. Um, and they wouldn't have somebody to supervise it. I don't, I don't know. Anybody else have a thought? Roger, did you want to expand upon your thoughts about finding a place to store the art artifacts, whether it's in mm -hmm. Waddington or St. Lawrence. Did you follow that? Do you want to expand the stuff at St. Lawrence? Um, the, you're referring to the collection at St. Lawrence? So, yeah, I could say a little bit more about how it, well, how it no, got there. You, you had mentioned your desire, and we all have our timelines in at some point, but to find a place to store all the Rickleton materials you've gathered, oh, uh, either in Waddington yeah. or perhaps at St. Lawrence University or something like that. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a problem when the, the, the little museum in Waddington was really, uh, the woman that was running it uh, really couldn't handle it. And it became necessary to, to shut it down. She had lost control of it as far as organ and so on. And when I got into that building, it was uh, in bad shape. The heat had been off for a while. Um, they had that same collection that I showed you of the uh, India book with the stereographs, the stereoscope, and the book Rickle had written. And they're moldy. They're, they're, I did not want to even borrow them to put them in another place so they could be seen. There was a, there was a gun that was there that was Rickle's, and that too was uh, rusting. And uh, so, I don't think they've solved that problem yet, but they have a committee that's trying to put that back together. But that is really a problem. I mean, it's a problem with somebody like me, a researcher. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be around forever, and I've got uh, a tremendous amount of stuff, and I would like it to go somewhere. But I like to be assured that uh, that it would be accessible to people, and that it would be taken care of, and so on. So that's a continued problem. But, uh, we're seeing that quarterly there on one of the streets. What do you have in your hand? <laughs> I have a copy that Roger kindly sent us of the St. Lawrence County Historical Association, Association quarterly publication um, that features his research on James Rickleton. Um, so we do have this at the library. I will make sure that we will catalog it so that it can be made available to Maplewood patrons if they're interested in learning more. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think Jim was distributing a few of these. I don't know exactly what happened there, Jim, but uh, I'm glad that you were doing that, uh, if that, that is the case. Yeah, I, I got about 20 copies about a week or two ago. And so I was going to let all my cousins know that if they send me their mailing address, and I'll send them an email to this effect, I'll send them a copy. Anyone in the, you know, it was many of the folks on the, on the uh, Zoom session here would be those folks. And thank you all for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Yes, I appreciate it. Uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm 
with any kind of photographs or information, I'd be more than happy to take a look at it. I feel like this is an, an incomplete project. I think Jim does that same feeling, but uh, if you can uh, have anything, uh, please let me know. Yeah, I have some photographs to give you and I'd love to get some photographs from you, so yeah. All right, well, let's, we'll, let's <laughs> start together. Okay. We'll make that happen. <laughs> All right, if nobody else has any more questions or comments, I think we will probably wrap this up. Um, thank you so much again to Roger and to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you for your help. Mm -hmm. Of course. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Take care. Good night.